and that you truly seek the Lord in your own heart as we come uh, before this service today. And Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for uh, this new day that you've given to us, this new week. Thank you for our health and strength to be able to be here today. And Lord, we do think of others who are not well, you're at home, maybe watching by way of Facebook, but uh, we pray for Miss Judy, Lord, that you'll give her uh, complete healing, and also for Miss Faye at home today, Lord, we pray that you'll help her to recover and be strengthened. Lord, we pray very especially for Brother Ed Davis, who went to the emergency room this morning. Uh, Lord, that you'll give the doctors wisdom concerning his condition, and we pray, Lord, that you will be with uh, him today and Miss Nancy. We pray for Brother Buck, Lord. Uh, that you will recover him from this uh, illness that he's had, help him to get home soon. And Lord, others who are not here with us today because of sickness, we ask and pray that you would heal their bodies. Help us all, Lord, to look to you for every need that we have. And Lord, as we gather together, we uh, seek your face, and we ask, O oh God, that you will teach us from your precious word. And Lord, we're so distracted in these days by the things of this life. Help us, Lord, just for a moment. Uh, to put our hearts' affection on things above. Lord, may our attention be drawn to eternal things. Help us, Lord, as we look into the Bible, that we might understand, Lord, your perfect will for all, all of us. Lord, if there's anybody here without uh, Jesus as their Savior, we pray that they would be saved, Lord, even today. And at the very least, Lord, that, uh, that you would help them to understand that salvation is the free gift of God. And we pray, Lord, for every believer. Help us, Lord, to be committed to you, and Lord, to seek you and to walk with you. And truly, Lord, not only to be a believer, but also to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus. And so, Lord, we pray that you'll bless the service. Help us, Lord, to uh, be blessed. Help us, Lord, to bless you as we worship you. May we minister to you, Lord, and may you get glory and praise and honor uh, from the fruit of our lips this morning as we sing, as we listen, as we pray. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. Please be seated, uh, if you would. And again, happy, uh, happy to have so many visitors with us today. We have some fir first-time visitors this morning. Glad to have you visiting with us. God bless right. you. Now, does everyone have a bulletin? If you don't put it, have a bulletin, just put your hand up real high, and one of our ushers will get one to you. And I think everyone in the cars has one this morning, hopefully. All right. Well, let me just turn your attention to a few of our announcements. There's several new things in here in the bulletin this morning. And uh, first of all, we're starting a brand new series on Sunday mornings on the subject of discipleship. And that will begin this morning as we consider the contradiction of discipleship. And uh, we're looking forward to having the children's choir singing for us this morning as well. And then tonight at 6 o'clock over at 525 West End Avenue at our church building, uh, we will have choir practice at 530, prayer meeting at 545. The youth fellowship will follow the song service. And uh, the message tonight will be the last in our series on 1 Peter. I think this is the 25th message in nine months we've been in this little book. It's been a wonderful study. And it's a warning from Peter as we close out the book about being sober, be vigilant. And so pay attention, uh, be watchful. And uh, right after this service tonight, we will have a special close business meeting for our church members. And then on Wednesday night, our prayer meeting and Bible study, we're continuing our study in the book of Genesis, and we're looking at uh, Abraham, this is part 18, the test of Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. Of course, the Jam Club for the boys and girls meet at the church on Wednesday at 7 as well. Don't forget GPS visitation on Tuesday at 6.30, meeting at the church. And then uh, this week also, there's the Tekoa Camp meeting over at Victory Baptist Church in Shelbyville. I think Brother Joe's going to be there all week. Uh, I'm going to try to get there on Friday, and if you maybe need um, transportation or you'd like to go, uh, we'd certainly pick, uh, pick you up and uh, take you to uh, Shelbyville. I'm not exactly sure when we're going yet, but if you'd like, if you'd like to go, let me know about that, and uh, we'll be going to the, uh, maybe the afternoon sessions and the evening service there at Victory Baptist Church, the Tacoa Camp Meeting. That's this coming uh, week. Uh, then also, next Sunday night, we will be starting a new series on Sunday night, and that coincides with our discipleship preaching in the morning time. This is a, a little series, six-week series on Discipleship 101, and we're going to have notes for this, and we're going to develop this into like a new members class for the church and a little booklet. And so uh, this is especially if you're a new member at the church or you're considering membership at the church, or if you've been at the church for the last 40 years, uh, it'll apply to all of us. 
and I hope that it'll be um, a meaningful time. We may have some question and answer time uh, during that Sunday night series as well. So, uh, oh, also, of course, the new church information app. This is called Realm Connect. Uh, so you can go on, if, you're, if you've got an iPhone, you go to the Apple Store. If you have an Android, go to Google Play. Uh, you'll be able to download the Realm Connect. And uh, some of you should have got, uh, in fact, if we've got your email, you will have got an email code from us, uh, possibly yesterday or sometime this week. And if you haven't got that code, then um, get it to us. I mean, get your email to us. And if you can get that contact to Miss Shari, and we'll make sure that you get an email with the contact uh, code. And so you open up the app, you put the code in, and uh, you register. And all the information about the church is going to be in there. Uh, you'll have lots of things will be taking place there. We'll know more about the church calendar, different events taking place. You'll be able to, it's kind of like a messenger app type thing, where you'll be able to talk to people uh, who are in the church, and uh, we'll be able to, you know, message everybody and let, let you know about the different things that are taking place. And with that in mind, we're, we're considering moving the, the Sunday morning service time from 11 to 10 o'clock. Now, uh, we're not going to do that this coming Sunday. We want to announce it for a couple of Sundays and kind of gauge what's happening. But, um, you know, if it's 95 degrees out here at 11 o'clock, at 10 o'clock, it's 94 degrees. No, <laughs> it should be a little cooler at 10 o'clock. And so we're considering moving the service time, not next week, but maybe the following week, from 11 o'clock to 10 o'clock. And it used to be 10 o'clock was Sunday school time, you know, so it shouldn't be too difficult. And, but, and guess what? You get early and get to the restaurants before the Methodists get there, and it's, it'll be wonderful. Uh, but primarily it's because of the weather, and we just don't want you to be suffering in the heat. And so just watch this space, but just that's a heads up, not next Sunday, but the following Sunday. Uh, the church to meet here at 10 o'clock. All right. Well, let's take our Bibles, please, this morning and turn to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, please, if you would. And uh, see, Colton drove his truck to church today. Is that the first time? You did? First time? Great. Good. And uh, it made it here. Amen. That's great. <laughs> That's a good old truck. Amen. I remember my first car wasn't a truck. We don't have trucks in Ireland. It was a you ever heard of a little Morris Mini, little Mini? That was my first car. I got it when I was 16. We don't get our license till we're 17, and my mom wrecked it before I got my license, so it was told. So anyway, everybody say, ah, oh, oh, okay, amen. Let's take our uh, Bibles, Luke 14. Let's stand together, please, if you're able, for the reading of God's Word. And we're going to begin in verse number 25 and read through verse 33. And there went great multitudes with him. And he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me, and hate not his father and mother, and wife and children, and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest happily after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? Or else, while the other's a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace." And so likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Lord, thank you for your precious word. Make it clear to us today. And Lord, I pray that the light of the gospel would shine in the hearts. And Lord, that somebody would receive the free gift of salvation today. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Please be seated if you would. And Brother Joe, make sure i got plenty of volume here because uh, I need all I can get this morning. Well, today we begin a, a brand new series on the subject of being a disciple of Christ, or we could say the study of discipleship. Now, it seems most people obviously have heard of Jesus and his 12 disciples, but did you know that Jesus wants you to be his disciple? And let me ask you this morning very pointedly, are you? Are you, are you a disciple of Jesus? 
Now, the title of the message this morning is The Contradiction of Discipleship. And any time you use the word contradiction in a religious sense, it always kind of pricks our ears up because it seems when we use the word contradiction, it signals that there's a problem. And I'm here to tell you this morning that there is a problem. Now, the problem is not with the Bible or with the truth of God, but as always, the problem is with us and our understanding of things. The Bible really doesn't have any contradictions in it. I've been studying the Bible for 42 years. Now, there's some things that lie on the surface, and you think, (laughs) sometimes you have one verse, and the very next verse will say it's almost like the opposite. Um, Like, uh, rebuke rebuke a fool, lest he be wise in his own conceits. The very next verse says, don't rebuke a fool, lest he turn on you. Is that a contradiction? No, it's... Anyway... The Lord sometimes lays things out there that when you really study it, it's wisdom and it's not a contradiction whatsoever. No, there's no contradictions in the Bible. But religions have contradictions and people have contradictions among themselves and we even have contradictions in our own hearts. But this morning I want to to see what this contradiction of discipleship is really all about. And what the Bible's answer is for that contradiction. I have to say that the subject today is one of the most controversial and misunderstood concepts in all of the religious world or the irreligious world. And really, it, 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 it's, it's about this question, what does God require for me in order to go to heaven? What is God's requirement for salvation? And we're going to look at that. And I hope you'll see the difference of these two subjects that we're going to speak about this morning. First of all, two points for us. First of all, I want us to consider the contradiction of discipleship. Now, please go to Luke 14, the passage we just read, and I want you to notice some things in this passage. In the scripture, Jesus explains to the multitude that discipleship costs. Now, if you were listening when we read this a few moments ago, you'll see this all the way through the scripture. Now, to be a disciple means one that follows Christ and is a learner of Jesus. In other words, Jesus is our teacher. If I'm his disciple, he's my teacher. He's my master and my Lord. And really, my allegiance and my first loyalty is to him above all others. And sir, that's really what he's expounding here in these verses in verse 26. He says, it will cost you your family. If a man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, is Jesus actually teaching you to, to hate your father and mother? No, he's basically, you know, we're, we're to love and honor our father and mother. We are to love our family and our loved ones. And, uh, but what he's saying here to us is that our allegiance, our first allegiance is to Christ. I remember when I told my mom and dad that I was going to leave home and give up my job and go to Bible school in America, the first reaction I got was not good at all. Uh, And obviously they were worried for me, and as a parent I can understand that. And I told them, I said, you know, I really want your blessings. I want to go with your blessings, but whether I get your blessings or not, I'm going because I feel that God would have me to do this. And thankfully they did end up giving me their blessing, but it was a very difficult thing. I remember at the, the Dublin airport in Ireland and heading for the, the 747, my mother said, you know, you never look back, you never waved, you never look back. I said, there's probably good reason for that. It was a very difficult thing. But when it comes to discipleship, um, our allegiance to Christ is above that of family. And discipleship many times will cost you relationships and even relationships within your family. Discipleship will cost you your life. It says uh, that he hates his own life also. In other words, that you put Christ above your very life, your, your own uh, wishes and desires and ambitions. And then in verse 27, Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And so discipleship will cost you comfort. Uh, many, many times discipleship will mean that you're going to have to do something that you really would rather not do. And it's going to cost you some things. It's going to cost you comfort. In fact, in verse 33, he says, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. In verse 28, he says, The disciples should sit down and count the cost. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he be 
uh, whether he have sufficient to finish it. Now I want you to see this is something that you have to pay. This is something discipleship costs you. And it's something that you have to start and it's something that you have to finish. In verse 29, lest happily after he hath laid the foundation, he is not able to finish it. Discipleship is something that you have to do, something that you have to finish. You know, he uses two illustrations here, one of building a building. We're hoping to build a building right down here. We haven't started yet. You know why we haven't started yet? Because we don't want to start it unless we know we can finish it. Can you imagine us putting a big slab out here? And people driving down this road, and 10 years later, all you've got is a slab. There's no building. People will they would, they would talk about you. They'd say, well, why did they put that big slab out there if they're not going to build a building? You can't start something unless you're willing and able to finish it. And so discipleship is something that's going to cost. Discipleship is expensive. Expensive to you and to me. Now, the important question is this. Do you have to be a disciple of Jesus to go to heaven when you die? Is discipleship a requirement for salvation and heaven? Now, some will say yes. There are those who teach what we call in theology, lordship salvation. And yet there are those, I remember um, being interviewed by a church to be one of their missionaries, and they believed in lordship salvation. I says, I don't believe that. And they said, well, is it, do you ever find in the Bible where there's unsaved people that would, would recognize Jesus as Lord? And somehow the Lord immediately put Matthew 7 in my mind where, it said, where Jesus said, Many shall say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils? And in thy name done many, many, many wonderful works? And then Jesus said that he would profess unto them, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity, I never knew you. And so they were unsaved people, yet they called Jesus Lord. And they were doing things um, in his name, good things, many wonderful works, and yet they weren't saved. But some people will say, yes, these verses that we have read today have to do with salvation. Now, this is where we find the contradiction. Now, stay with me for just a wee minute. We're going somewhere with this. Because it is true that discipleship costs. There's no doubt about that here. It's as clear as the nose on, on your face. But what we also find is that the Bible is clear that salvation is the free gift of God. Amen. And salvation is not something you pay for. It's not something you begin. It's not something you have to finish. But it is something that Jesus began and something that Jesus paid for and something that Jesus accomplished. And on the cross, he said, it is finished. He was the one that accomplished redemption. Salvation is not of man. Salvation is of the Lord. Now, I do want to prove this to you. So let's go to the, the one book in the New Testament that is very clear about salvation. In fact, they're all clear, aren't they? But uh, the, the book of Romans is what we call Paul's systematic theology of how to be right with God. And in the first three chapters, he deals with condemnation, that we're in trouble. You know, you never go to the doctor until you know you're sick. No sense of us talking about a cure if you don't think you need a cure. So he starts out with the problem, the diagnosis. And then he deals with salvation. So there's condemnation. Then justification. Justification is the judicial act of God whereby he declares this believing sinner to be righteous. It's how to be righteous, how to be justified in the sight of God. Last part of chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5. When you get to chapter 6, he's talking about, as a Christian, how to, be, how to walk with God. It's ta it talks about sanctification, chapter 6 and 7. When you get to chapter 8, it talks about our future, our glorification. What a wonderful thing that is. And then chapter 9, 10, and 11 is dispensational where he talks about Israel and the church being different and so on, how Jews are saved in chapter 10 and so on. When you get to chapter 12 through chapter 16, it's all about what you should do for God. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In other words, because of all the mercies of God that you've got in the first 11 chapters, here's what now you should do for God. You know, it's always that way. What religion puts it back to front. 
Religion gets the cart before the horse. Religion says you do this for God, you do this, you do this, you do, be a disciple and you uh, pay the cost and you pay the price and, and you sacrifice for the Lord and you work for the Lord and do good works and then maybe God will save you. Maybe then God will take you to heaven. That's not what you find in the Bible. No, salvation comes first. And you know what? That's the motivation to live for God. I'm not living for God to go to heaven. I'm already, I'm already as good and, and as in heaven. My reservations are already made. But because of what God has done for me, he's, motivated, he's captivated my heart. I love him and I want to do the things that please him. And that's the motivation that I have in my heart, to do the things that are pleasing in the sight, because he's already saved me. Don't get the cart before the horse. Now, what I want us to see in Romans chapter 3 is, is that salvation is free. Now, we'll just look at a few verses. But in, in Romans chapter 3, look at verse 24. Then we know verse 23, everybody knows that one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Then it says, verse 24, being, that's present tense. There's that word justified, to be made righteous. Being justified, what's the next word? Freely, by his grace. You see, that's what grace is. Grace is the opposite of works. Works is you're trying to deserve it. You're trying to earn it. You're trying to make God your debtor, that God owes you something. That's what works is. But grace is he owes us nothing. Right. And we're saved by his grace. And then if you look, by, and if you go on there, he says uh, in verse 27, where is boasting then? You know, if I was getting to heaven by my efforts, I could boast about it. We could sit in heaven. Oh, you know, I was a really good person. Do you know, I was a pastor for so many years and I was a missionary for so many years. And uh, I left my home and, and went to Bible school and blah, 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 blah. And sitting around in heaven boasting, do you think so? No. In fact, if you look up at verse 2 of chapter 4, for if Abraham were justified by works, he have were of the glory. In other words, he has reason to boast, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. When you're working, you're trying to make God your debtor. God, you owe me. Because I've done for this, you owe me heaven. You owe me salvation. But that's not the truth. God is no man's debtor. Look at verse 5. This is really amazing. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Do you know in order to go to heaven, you've got to stop working? If you're trying to be good to go to heaven, you've got to, you've got to quit that. You've got to stop that because you're going in the wrong direction. You're looking at the wrong thing. You're looking at yourself. You need a savior outside of yourself. And by the way, if you're honest with yourself, you realize you've messed up already. But anyway... I digress. Look at chapter 5 and verse number 15. He says, But not as the offense, who also is the free gift. He's talking about salvation here. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God, and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. He's talking about Adam got us into trouble. Jesus gets us out of trouble. And, what, and how Jesus does that is he presents a gift, the gift of eternal life to us by his grace. And so is the gift, the Bible says, for the judgment was, not, was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses on the justification. For by one man's offense, that's Adam, death reigned by one much more. They receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. I want you to notice that. Righteousness is a gift. It's not your righteousness. It's the righteousness that comes back from God to you. It's given to you. It's imparted to you. Look at verse 18. Therefore, as by one, sorry, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. In other words, God, Adam got us all in trouble. Even so, even so is like the pivot on a seesaw. How many people did Adam get into trouble? Is it just some people or all people? All people. Now the Calvinists don't like this. But this pivot's going to do like this. Because what's true on one side is going to be true on the other side. He said, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men on the justification of life. Here's what he said. Adam got us all into trouble. Jesus came and he died upon the cross for all people. And now he's offering to everybody the free gift of salvation. It's not just to the elect. It's not just to some people. It's to everybody. The same group that Adam got into trouble, the same group Jesus is here to get us out of trouble. But here's the condition. He's offering a gift. How do you get a gift? You must receive it. 
He came unto his own, his own received him not, but as many as received him to them give he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Look at chapter 6, verse 23, another well-known verse. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, did the Bible just say that the gift of God is eternal life? Is eternal life something we deserve, something we earn, or is it a gift? It's so clear, it's the gift of God. Ephesians 2 at 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Now, some, the Calvinist says that the faith is not of yourselves. No, it's the salvation is not of yourselves. It, the salvation, is not faith is the gift of God, but salvation is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Jesus said in John 4 to the woman at the well of Samaria, she came for water. And he was there to give her water, but it wasn't the water out of Jacob's well. It was the water that springs up into everlasting life. This is the water of relationship with God that satisfies the thirsty soul. And here's what he said here. If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith unto thee, give me the drink, you would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Jesus said the salvation was a gift. He says, I am salvation. He says, if you, would knew, if you knew who I was, if you knew the gift of God, Jesus is the gift from God to heaven, from heaven to earth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus is a gift from the Father to us. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that said that he gave me to drink, you'd have asked of me. People say, well, where do you pray for salvation? Well, Romans 10 verse 23, or verse uh, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word call means a desperation of cry, a cry of desperation. It's like you're drowned and you're going down for the third time and with the last breath in your body, you're calling. That's what it means. And friend, let me tell you something. If you ask Jesus to save you, I don't care who you are, where you are, if you truly believe the message of salvation and you cannot save yourself and you need him to save you and you ask him to, he will. He said, if you would ask me, I, he would have given thee living water. Right there, John 4.10 says you can ask him for eternal life and he'll give it to you. What's wrong with that? And it's because we believe that we cry, you see. And so what we find is that very clearly the Bible teaches that salvation is the gift of God. It's not costing you anything. I received a flyer in the mail about six months, I think it was about six months ago, maybe less than that, from one of our local car dealerships in Smithville. I can, see, I can see Carol of Fever laughing right now, right through your windshield, I can see you laughing. <laughs> well, you get these all the time, right? Now, I'm pretty savvy. I got, I got taken with one of these when Leslie and I were first married, you know, and I, I'm very leery about these offers, you know, this, uh, uh, these flyers that say you've won something. Well, this flyer said that I had won a 60-inch flat-screen TV, now, here's what I do. I flip over to the, the, the fine print, and I'm looking at the, the odds of winning. See, that's, the, that's, the how you, that's how you figure this out. And usually, uh, one of the prizes is a Walmart gift card. Of course, they don't tell you what it is, but it's $5, okay? Now, this is for free today. You listen to what I'm telling you. It's going to save you a lot of money or a lot of heartache. So I'm thinking, okay, what did I win? It's got to be the Walmart card. Well, I look back, and it was like 49999 to 50000 you're going to get the Walmart card. But that's, I didn't, it wasn't a Walmart card that I won. It was the flat screen TV. And the flat screen TV odds was 1 in 50,000. I thought, I have won the prize. I says, I start measuring the, the living room. I says, how are we going to put this 50, 60 inch screen, screen TV on my little TV scone? Listen, I was so excited. I honestly, hook, line, and sinker. So I called them up. I says, I want to come in, make an appointment. Okay, yes, just come on. So they knew, really. And so the first thing, I got there to the car dealership, and the place was crawling with people. I thought, well, that's, everybody's here. And the first sign I was in trouble was a man over here in the corner was here before me. And he was explaining that he had driven from the other side of Sparta. This man had driven a long way to come to the dealership, and he was not a happy camper. I said, oh, oh, something's not right. So uh, immediately I says to the guy, I says, come here. I said, did I win? There it is. It says, I have won a, a 60-inch flat screen TV. It says there that I have won this TV. Have I won that TV? Am I getting the TV? He says, well, what you have to do is come over. 
No, you're not getting the TV. You have to buy the car to get the TV, as far as I could see. That was it. I just walked out and walked home. I was so angry. I got home and I called them up. I said, you know, you have people traveling from all over Warren County and White County and DeKalb County because they thought they got a TV. And I'm telling you something. I'll never buy a car from your dealership because you lied. Do you know when God says that salvation is free? The Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. I'm telling you something. God is true. And if he tells you that salvation is the gift of God, it is a gift. It will cost you nothing. It is the most expensive gift a person could ever have. But you don't pay a cent. He paid all of it. It cost God his son to redeem us. And we have nothing in our hand to bring simply to the cross to cling. My friend, if you make discipleship and salvation the same thing, you have a really bad contradiction. But the second point I want to make is this. First of all, the contradiction of discipleship. But secondly, the contrast of discipleship. Because in my view, instead of a contradiction here, there is no contradiction in the Bible. Because the Bible is not claiming that discipleship and salvation are the same thing. What it is explaining to us is that there's a contrast here. They are two different things. Because it is true discipleship costs, and it is also true that salvation is free. There is no contradiction. They are two different things altogether. Now, let me explain that to you. Now, this is why this is so important. Because you, 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 you mix these two things up, you can lose your salvation. You don't even know how to be saved. You don't need where to start in order to get saved. Because discipleship is a very involved thing. You see, salvation, now watch, salvation is something that God does for you. Discipleship is something you do for God. Some people believe that, that baptism is part of your salvation. No, it's not the last thing in your salvation. By the way, those who believe that don't believe it's the last thing either because you've got to be, well, you've got to hear and you've got to believe, you've got to understand, you've got to repent, you've got to confess, you, you know, you've got to believe, then you've got to get baptized, but then you've got to be faithful and you've got to do this and that and the other thing and you really don't know that you've got it anyway. That's really their message. No, baptism is not the last thing on salvation. It's the first thing in discipleship because what you're doing, baptism is something you're doing for God. You're saying to the world, oh, I'm a Christian. I'm publicly proclaiming that I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, that might cost you something. It might not cost you something in this country. But you go to some of these uh, Muslim countries or, and you start getting, you get baptized. If you're a, from an Orthodox Jewish family, and you believe upon Christ, and you get saved, and you get baptized, they'll, they'll have a funeral for you. You're dead as far as they're concerned. That's going to cost you everything. It's going to cost you your family. It might even cost you your life. Uh, baptism is part of discipleship. It's something you do for God. It's going to cost you. Salvation involves Christ bearing his cross. Salvation is all about the cross of Christ. And yet when we talk about salvation, I mean, uh, 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 discipleship, discipleship is about your cross. Whosoever does not take up and bear his cross daily, cannot be my disciple. <clears throat> In other words, we have to be selfless. We have to be ready to die. We have to say no to ourselves. I mean, who, who wants to experience the cross? Jesus experienced the cross on our behalf. He died for us. We experience the cross for his sake, and for his honor, and for his glory. Salvation involves Christ's cross. Discipleship involves your cross. Salvation costs God everything. It costs you nothing. Discipleship, on the other hand, will cost you everything. Salvation is about believing. Discipleship is about serving. Salvation is about faith. Discipleship is about works. Now watch this very carefully. Salvation is when you come to Christ. Discipleship is when you go with Christ or you go after Christ. Now, let me show you that. Look here back in Luke chapter 14 for just a wee minute. <clears throat> Look at Luke chapter 14. And I want you to notice very carefully because this is not the only place these words are used. You'll see this consistently when it talks about discipleship and salvation. 
And we'll notice another passage here in just a moment. <clears throat> in Luke 14, verse 26, notice the very first thing that says. It says, if any man come to me. Now, what I submit to you this morning is that phrase is describing salvation. Before I got saved, I wasn't anywhere near Jesus. But when God was dealing with my heart and I came to the Lord, I came to know the Lord. <clears throat> I came to Christ. And that was my salvation. And the thing that happens after we're saved is God wants us not just to be believers, not just to come to him, but also to follow him. You know, he doesn't want us to come to him and then he walks off and we're just standing there. He wants us to go with him. And so in verse 27, whosoever doth not bear his, his cross, now watch, and come after me. Notice the two phrases, verse 26, come to me. Verse 27, come after me. Two different things. Coming to Christ is salvation. Coming after Christ is discipleship. Now let's look at Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11 teaches us the same thing. Now these are well-known verses, but I want you to see this. And what we're saying here is that there's a contrast between salvation and discipleship. So in Matthew 11 verse 28, he says, Come unto me. All you that labor and are heavy laden. You know that's what religious people are. They're burdened down, trying to keep all their rules. There's no life there. It's just a drudgery. And I want you to stop and think about this. Do you know the churches are filled with people who are disciples, but who are not believers? What do you think unsaved people, religious people, do when they go to church every Sunday? Well, I know some churches, they're doing the Reader's Digest, or they're taking something out of the Southern Standard. <clears throat> but many churches around the world, when we were in Northern Ireland, the largest denomination in Northern Ireland is the Presbyterian Church, as far as the Protestants were concerned. And I've literally knocked on hundreds of doors and talked to hundreds and hundreds of people, and I've asked them this question. I said, first of all, you know, to get into the conversation, I said, you know, I'm Tom Fittis, we're from Berean Baptist Church, and we're here talking to people about the Lord. Do you go to church anywhere? Oh, yes, son. Oh, we go to church every Sunday. Well, that's wonderful. Well, what church do you go to? Well, we go to Hyde Park Presbyterian Church. Well, that's wonderful. And Well, let me ask you this. Are you a Christian? Are you a saved Presbyterian? Oh, no, son. No, no, no. No, we're, we're not saved. I says, you're not saved, but you go to church every Sunday. Oh, yes, we go to church every Sunday. But you're not saved. No, we're not saved. Now, what do you think those people do when they go to church? Well, the minister gets up there, and he's reading out of the Gospels. He's reading out from the Bible. He's teaching Christian principles to people who are not Christians. I, I said, that, I give this illustration a few, a few weeks ago, where I heard this, this preacher give this story when I was in Bible school, and he talked about this famous uh, baseball game, and it was the ninth inning, it was the last, I, I don't really know anything about baseball, but it was the last thing, it was the last ball, the last pitch, was, and the bases were loaded, and so the batter hit the ball out of the park, and he started running, and he, he skipped over first base, he hit second base, he hit third base, he came home and slid into home base, and the crowd went wild, and the umpire looked at him, he says, you're out. Do you know why? Because he skipped over first base. You have to hit all the bases. And you can't come and say, well, I'm a Christian and I'm going to be a disciple. You could even get baptized. You could join the church. You can get involved in all the Christian teachings. But if you don't get saved, if you're not a believer, you're not going to heaven. Because it's not being a disciple that will take you to heaven. It's being a believer that will take you to heaven. And so... In verse 28, he says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, laden with sin, laden with religion. He's talking to Jewish people. The law of Moses, heavy laden, and I will give you. It's a gift. I will give you rest. Here's what he's saying. Come to me, I'll give you rest. Come to me, I'll give you salvation. How do we get it? We come to him. What does he do? He gives it to us. Look at the next verse. The next verse is not salvation. The next verse is discipleship. In verse 29, he says, take my yoke upon you. Now, take me, that's an invitation. Jesus is not going to come, you know what a yoke is, you know? You know when a farmer's playing with oxen or horses, the horse, if he's playing with a team of oxen or a team of horses or a team of mules, he's got two mules and he's got this contraption with these collars that go around their neck and the collars are hooked onto this wooden thing that pulls the plow or pulls the, tra the trailer or whatever it is. And... Um, 
you know, hopefully you've got two um, mules that are equally balanced. I always think of this big, 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 big horse and this little tiny pony. Wouldn't be fair, would it? But anyway, when we think of yoke, we're thinking of restriction. We're thinking of work. We're thinking of service. And Jesus will not make you serve him. He will not make you be a disciple. He will not try to control you. It's something that you must volunteer. Now, why do we volunteer? It's because he gave us rest. It's because he saved our souls. It's because he loves us. Because we love him. That's why we're willing to take the yoke. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart and ye shall find rest. So there's a given rest. That's salvation. And then there's a found rest in serving God and walking with God and coming to Christ we get saved and coming after Christ there is the rest of service for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so when we study discipleship we find a contrast. They're not the same. Discipleship and salvation are two different things. Thirdly, I told you I was doing two points, didn't I? I lied. I forgot about the third point. All right, I've got six minutes. Right. <clears throat> the third point is the consequences of discipleship. So I repeat the question, do you have to be a disciple to go to heaven when you die? Can I tell you what the answer is from the Bible? No. What takes you to heaven is believing, not being a disciple, but being a believer. Let me ask you something. Did Judas go to heaven? No, the Bible is very clear that he went, he was a son of perdition. Perdition means hell or judgment. He went to his own place, Jesus said. Judas is in hell right now. But let me ask a second question. Was Judas a disciple? Jesus didn't have 11 disciples. He had 12 disciples. Was Judas a disciple? Yes, he was. Did he walk with Christ? Did he learn of Christ? Uh, was, did, did Christ, um, did he serve Christ? Yep. Third question, was Judas a believer? No. No, he wasn't. How do you know that? Because the Bible says so. Where does it say it? John chapter 6. Let's look at John chapter 6. You're in Matthew there. Look over to John chapter 6. Now, I hope this is not boring to you because what I'm talk talking about here today is really, really important. And if the people of our city, our town, our county, our country, our world could understand the principles that I'm talking of, it would save a whole lot of confusion. In John chapter 6, look at verse number 60. And I will have to rush here, but in verse 60 it says, Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is an hard saying, who can hear it? And, and when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at, at it, he said unto them, Does this offend you? Um, if you come down to verse 64, he says, But there are some of you, that believe not. Some of you, you see, it wasn't just the 12 disciples he was speaking to. There's, there's multitudes who were following Christ at this point. <clears throat> and these disciples, when they heard the saying that he was the bread of God that came down from heaven, they said, we don't understand this. This is a hard saying. Did you know that you, that, that you can fail in discipleship? Now, you can't fail in salvation because salvation doesn't depend upon you. It depends upon him. But discipleship depends upon you. And you can fail. You see, I can fail in being a student, which is what a disciple is, but I cannot fail in being a son. There'll never be a time when Tom Fittis is not the son of Tommy and Jean Fittis in County Antrim, Northern Ireland. I was, always be, I, I, was, I was born their son. I will always be their son. I might not be a very good son at times, but I am always their son. I can never fail at being a son. I'm, I'm always their son. But there's a time, I can drop out of schooling, I can drop out of teaching, I can drop out of discipleship. <clears throat> In fact, Jesus said, if you look at verse 66, from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, will ye also go away? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. But I want you to come back to verse 64. He says, some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not. Now watch, and who should betray him? Well, who is that? Look at verse 70. Jesus answered them, have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? 
He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for, it, uh, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Was Judas a disciple? Yes. Did, Jesus, or did Judas go to heaven? No. Why? Because Judas was not a believer. But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that, should believe, that believed not who should betray him. Judas was a disciple, but he was not a believer. Being a disciple will not take you to heaven. Only being a believer will take you to heaven. And so the consequences of believing upon Christ is eternal life. If you believe on Christ, if you come to Christ, if you receive him, the gift of God, you have eternal life. So what are the consequences of being a disciple? Well, the consequences of being a disciple is not the salvation of your soul, but actually the salvation of your life. Think of the thief. So here's, here's Judas, who was a disciple but not a believer. He went to hell. There's another guy that we learn about in the Bible who was a believer but not a disciple. Did you know you can be one without the other? Some of you may be in here right now or sitting or, or listening who are believers, you're saved, but you're not a disciple. You're doing your own thing. And some of you may be really good people and, and religious people. You may belong to church. You're here today and you're thinking, well, I'm a good Christian. You're a disciple, but you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. The other person I'm thinking about is the thief on the cross. He wasn't a disciple, man. He was a rogue. He was a thief and a robber. He deserved to die for his crimes. He said so. In fact, right at the beginning of the crucifixion, both of the thieves were available. Both of them were casting the same in his teeth. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And three hours later, one of the thieves started to revile Jesus again. And both of the thieves had seen something in three hours. And the other thief stopped them. And he says, wait a minute. He says, you and me, we deserve this. But this man hasn't done anything wrong. And he turned to Jesus and he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He's crying out for mercy. He became a believer in Jesus. What kingdom? Jesus is going to die on the cross. Well, he must believe that Jesus is going to be raised from the dead. He must believe Jesus had a future and a future kingdom. Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Was he a disciple? Did he get baptized? Did he join a church? Did he do any good works? He was a bad man, but he was a believer and he went to heaven, but he was not a disciple. So here you have a disciple who goes to hell. And a non-disciple that goes to heaven. Discipleship doesn't see it. It is believing. Judas didn't believe. But the thief on the cross did. So the consequences for discipleship are this. If you're a disciple, it doesn't save your soul. Believing saves your soul. But what it will do is it saves your life. You see, the thief on the cross, his life was over. He died on the cross. He didn't have a future in this life. But you know when you got saved, you didn't die. You're still here. That God has a purpose and plan for your life. There's something that he wants to do with your life. And he wants to impart that knowledge to you. Here's what Jesus said. Whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. Now that's, that's a, a contradiction in some ways. You know, God has these... Um, uh, these these conundrums where the way up is down. If you abase yourself, you'll be exalted. If you exalt yourself, you'll be abased. There's many things like that. And what he's saying is this. If you're trying to hold on to your life, you're going to lose it. I said a few moments ago, some of you may not be, uh, you may be believers, but you're not disciples because you're doing your own thing, right? Because you've got your life, you've got your ambitions, you've got things that you want to do. And uh, God really is just taking the back seat. He doesn't care what you do. You're saving your life. You're going to do your thing with your life. You know when you get to my age, you're going to turn back and say, you know what? I wasted my life. And some of you are actually there right now. You look back on your life and you said, I've wasted most of my life. I've been trying to save my life. I lost it. I didn't find out really what God's purpose for me was. And then there's some people that, <clears throat> because they got saved and they love the Lord, and they give the Lord everything. They become a follower of Christ. And they say, Lord, I'm not much, but whatever I am, I give to you, and I want to serve you with my life. And people say, well, you shouldn't do it. There's better things you can do with your life. Well, yes. But you say, well, I'm going to do it anyway. And you start serving the Lord. And, and you know, you find out that God has given you the certain abilities. And God gives you a certain favor. 
And God puts you in places where he uses you. And there's, oh my goodness, I was talking to a man, Cecil. Um, wait a minute, where's Leslie now here? Uh, I think it was night before last. This is a friend that used to be in our church in Tullahoma, Cecil Mathis. And he was calling me about getting some missionaries. But uh, anyway, and we, we talked about, he says, he says, do you remember, Brother Tom, when you took me soul winning? Now this is, I was only at a Bible school. I can't, you can't, I can't remember what happened last week. He says, we went to a certain uh, lady's house. She was uh, Pentecostal and her husband wasn't saved. And you were talking to the lady. In fact, I kind of do remember this because she said she hadn't sinned in like 40 years or something. But anyway, but the husband was there. And I was talking to the lady, but he was listening and he started crying. And so old Cecil, he got over beside the man. And then the Lord, he won the, the, the man to the Lord. He got saved that day. And to be honest with that, I forgot all about that. But Cecil said, do you not remember that? I said, well, kind of vaguely, you know. He says, okay, well, it's the greatest experience I've ever had in my life is leading somebody to Jesus. Other than getting saved, other than getting saved yourself, it's the greatest experience you ever have. And I have to say, he's absolutely right. There's no greater joy that you'll have than sitting with somebody who, who's interested, who's hungry, who's thirsty, and you break the bread of life and you tell them the gospel and they make a decision and they get saved and the joy that comes on their face, sometimes they're crying because of relief and their life is changed. There is nothing better than that. I have to say that I didn't go back over my life. I'm 60 years old now. I've been saved for 42 years. And I'm sure I could have done things a whole lot better. There's things I regret. There's things I could have done better. But I'll tell you what. I do not regret walking in in that service that morning and saying I'm giving my life to the Lord. I don't regret it. Because you know what? People say you're losing your life. Oh, yes. You don't know what you're doing. You know what I did? I see it in my life. I see it in my life. Now, I'm sure I'm not what I could have been, but I'm not what I was, but I saved my life. Jesus said, if you seek to save it, you'll lose it. And yet, if you lose your life for my sake in the gospel, you will save it. You will find your life. That's what it means to be a disciple. You find your purpose. You find your life. You find your fulfillment. You find your joy. <laughs> Let me tell you something. People who are disciples are happy people. They enjoy what they're doing. Way more than what I did before I was saved. I wasn't a believer, I wasn't a disciple either. I was doing my own thing. And there was pleasure in sin, but it didn't bring peace, it didn't bring fulfillment, it didn't bring satisfaction, true satisfaction. It didn't bring me happiness, it didn't bring me joy. Do you know God is the author of your life? And if you let him have his way with you, you'll find it's the most fulfilling thing you've ever done. Not only that, but God will use you. You know, God wants to use you. Here's what he said in Mark chapter 1, verse 17. Come after me. There it is again. He doesn't say come to me. He says, come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. If you're a disciple and you're following Christ, that's what he said to Peter. He says, come on, leave your nets. From henceforth I shall catch men. There's no greater joy than that. And you know what? When you're a disciple, it means that your life is being used now in the service of God and you're doing the will of God now. And you know what? You're going to get rewards now. Peter said, we've forsaken all. And Jesus said, if you've forsaken your, your wife and your children and your home and your lands, you'll receive a hundredfold in this life. You'll be rewarded. But also in the next life, you'll be rewarded. People think their Christian life doesn't mean anything. As long as they're saved, they get into heaven by the skin of their teeth. It won't matter. But it will matter. It doesn't, you don't think about it right now. But when you're in heaven at the judgment seat of Christ, your whole life, which could have been, will matter to you. And if you've been following the Lord, my friend, there is, this, there is reward. If you've been following the Lord, there's rewards for discipleship. Rewards here and now. Rewards in heaven. And it means walking after Christ. Walking with Christ. Discovering him. And also discovering yourself. Jesus said I can recommend it. As we close, let me ask you something. Are you a disciple? We're going to be talking about this in the next weeks. If you come on Sunday night, next Sunday night we're going to start a course on practical discipleship. What does that look like? We want to help you with that. But there's only one person that can take the yoke, and that's you. 
no, the pastor's not going to take the yoke and put it on you. Jesus is not going to take the yoke and put it on you. You've got to reach out and say, Lord, I want, the, I want the yoke. And he'll give it to you. And then he's going to control you and he's going to use you. But there's rest in that. There's a given rest, but there's a found rest. I'll, you'll find rest unto your souls. There's no greater joy and contentment when the Lord has used you. The preachers will know this. Maybe you, you preach a, a message. Usually it's in some other church or whatever. <laughs> and uh, and uh, the Lord has used you in some way. And you, you get out of the service and maybe you open a bottle of water and you're sitting at your car and you're thinking about how the Lord is blessed. Oh, my goodness. What's it like, brother? Isn't it great? You put your head on your pillow at night. Oh, it's, it's great, isn't it, Joe? The satisfaction, the peace, the rest that happens. Are you a disciple? Jesus wants you to be. But you know, before you become a disciple, there's something that has to happen. You've got to believe. So let me ask you this as we close. Are you a believer? Because the unfortunate thing is that this is a very confusing thing. People think, well, to go to heaven, you've got to, you've got to pay the cost. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. You've got to give up this. You've got to start this. You've got to stop that. When the Bible says salvation is a gift, if you receive the gift, you have it. You have him. Are you a believer? Maybe you've been confused by that. I've been preaching this this morning to help unconfuse you. Salvation is free. It's simple. All you have to do is to be willing. Isn't that what we preached a few weeks ago? Whosoever will may come and he'll save you. Do you know the gift of God? Have you asked him for living water? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your precious word. Thank you for the instruction of Jesus. Lord, you've captivated us with your love, with your sacrifice, with the free gift of salvation. Lord, we don't work to salvation. We work from salvation. Works as the fruit, not the root. You save us first, and then you motivate us to give our lives to you. Help us, Lord, to be disciples. But, Lord, maybe there's somebody here who needs to be a believer. Help them to come to you, Lord. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.